chaos, confusion and anger growing in the wake of President Trump's immigration. Demonstrations against Donald Trump's immigration ban continue nationwide. Over the past two weeks, the American news media have been assigned a big story, a steady stream of executive orders from President Donald Trump. The bulk of the headlines were about the ban temporarily blocking travelers, including refugees, from seven Muslim-majority countries from entering the U.S. The resulting protests got plenty of coverage, the tone of which is worth exploring. The mainstream news media's treatment of this story was tinged with outrage, but it came with its own baggage. Because anyone paying attention to the American news media post 9-11 would find it difficult to escape the conclusion that the media themselves laid more than a little of the groundwork upon which today's Islamophobic narrative was built. Whether they did that for reasons that were ideological or simply commercial is beside the point. The war on terror narrative could not have prevailed the way it did in the U.S. without the complicity of the American news media. And it's that fear that the new White House is now capitalizing upon. Our starting point this week is New York City. It was as though the anti-Trump movement got an executive order to hit the streets. And unlike the demonstrations that came before, starting on Inauguration Day, scheduled and organized, the ones provoked by the travel ban were spontaneous, unplanned. And they provided a visual feast for the news cameras. When the people mobilized in the thousands and started marching, that's when you saw mainstream media pick up from social media and connect. And literally, reporters then went to the airports and it became a story that didn't die. And then you saw social media erupt. They've stayed on it because the people are out there, and that's what everyone's talking about. The media is also struggling to cover this flurry and to try to understand what each executive order is doing, who is it going to benefit, who it's going to harm. I think it's going to be very successful. By the time they even get a handle on one, a new one has cropped up. And it might be a deliberate strategy of keeping the media and the people on their toes and feeling unstable as a way to push through so many of these uh, challenges to democratic norms all at once. It's even more difficult for journalists to get the facts because enforcement agencies might receive one set of instructions um, from the executive branch and then another decision might be made from the judiciary and there, there's just a lot of uncertainty and conflicting information. Also, reporters can't trust anything coming out of the White House press office. Welcome back. Because Sean Spicer got up within the first few days of office and lied to the public and the press. The Trump administration seems eager to make the media the story. The president dismissed CNN's work again this past week. But I don't watch CNN, so I don't get to see as much as I do. I don't like watching fake news. His advisor, Kellyanne Conway, asks aloud on the airwaves when news outlets will fire reporters who were quote unquote wrong about Donald Trump. We're, we're, who's cleaning house? Which one is going to be the first network to get rid of these people who said things that just weren't true? Talk about And things. Chief of Staff Steve Bannon continues to berate the New York Times, among others. So Steve Bannon, the man who ran Breitbart, is now telling the media to shut up uh, and is calling us the opposition party. If you critique us in any way, shape or form, the President of the United States is going to call you out as fake news, like he did with New York Times and CNN. Uh, if you oppose our agenda in any way, we're going to be hostile to you and we're going to cut off access to you and you are the, quote, opposition party. That's one way of controlling the flow of information in our society. If you completely discredit the media and the people who are supposed to be guardians of the facts and disseminate true information, the only other source of information is you. Sean Spicer said uh, in one of his earliest press conferences that the Trump administration was going to be a check on the media. The media is supposed to serve as the fourth estate. It's supposed to serve as a check on power. The White House checking the media, that's just fascism. That's authoritarianism, almost pure and simple. Selling a brand of authoritarianism is much more difficult if the electorate has not been conditioned, primed, for that kind of message. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries. And over the years, the U.S. news media have helped with the priming. 
We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. From 9-11 on, starting with the false Iraq WMD story and moving through sporadic attacks in the U.S., the coverage has veered towards the sensational and too often the unquestioning. Such as the Boston Marathon bombings in 2013, when an entire city was shut down, schools closed, and a no-fly zone imposed as police and the military searched for a single 19-year-old suspect. The basic question all Americans want to know this morning is how do we better protect ourselves? Really of all the questions the networks and news outlets were asking at the time, as they rose in the ratings and counted the clicks, why and are the security measures warranted were not among them. And so all of us are guilty, not just CNN, not just MSNBC, not just Fox News, but also people on social media. And it's something I think that we, as a result of San Bernardino, yeah, we have two books that appear to be the Quran. Let me... As a result of the Pulse shooting, uh, he apparently was screaming uh, some some words in a foreign language. As a result of what happened um, in uh, the Boston bombing, I was told by one of these sources, who was a law enforcement official, uh, that this was a dark-skinned male. Adds to the climate of sensationalism, hate, and hysteria. We have to remember that uh, the media played a role in invading Iraq. Judith Miller at the Times reported statements coming from the federal government that turned out not to be accurate later and that led the public to believe uh, one thing and um, I think that it was very easy for the White House to drum up fear post 9-11. It was almost a go-to reaction and the media was not immune from that fear. So, so Mayor, I will start with you. You govern a majority Muslim mm -hmm. American city. Are you afraid? The media adopted terminology like Islamic terrorist without really thinking about the implications of that. We have to really take a step back and see what's our role, what's our responsibility, and how can we not promote that type of a sensationalism. Consider what this media activist told the Listening Post in the aftermath of the Boston bombings in light of the news coverage Americans were seeing at the time and where it could lead. The interview took place in April 2013, three and a half years before the election of Donald Trump. The after effect of the kind of alarmist and hysterical and finger pointing coverage that we saw of the Boston bombing really softens the public up, really makes us feel frightened makes us feel confused and really leaves us very, very vulnerable to whatever is going to be brought forward as a solution. Anything media does that makes us unquestioningly frightened is going to feed into that problem. How do you get into the mind or change the mindset of someone who really believes kill, kill, kill? And it is going to make us ultimately a, a much more dangerous society and not a safer one. In these dark days for the U.S. news media, there are rays of light, a few shards of hope, signs, tangible, data-backed evidence that Americans are growing more engaged and less apathetic vis-a-vis -vis their politics and the news outlets through which the political story is told. Many people within the U.S. are now reinvesting in the mainstream media and re-legitimizing it, like the newspapers. And, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, their subscriptions have soared. And CNN seems to also be kind of um, rewriting its own mission in that way, to, to bringing back the sense that the media is the fourth estate, that is the media's job to hold power accountable and to challenge the kind of non-transparency of politics, hoping that the mainstream media is really one of the key institutions right now that can hold this administration's feet to the fire.